All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the podcast. We have a really cool guest today. He is Mr. Tom Murphy, from currently from Southern California. He's a physicist. Uh, he's worked at UC San Diego for several years and has, uh, on the side, developed a really, really interesting blog called Do the Math, which I've been following on and off for years uh, that tracks all sorts of issues related to sustainability or unsustainability, really, uh, the human predicament, and how did we get here and where do we go from here? And so that's the kind of general sketch, I think, about what we're going to talk about today. Um, I would say to maybe just to kind of kick things off. Um, so if I remember right, Tom, the way maybe a sort of seminal incident happened several years back where if I and tell me if I'm not remembering this right. But you were at a, a dinner party or something like that, seated next to an economist and basically started to get an earful of some of the crazy things that mainstream economists believe. And you're like, hold on a second. That doesn't make any sense. Let's do some calculations and 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 see if we can make sense of this. And that seemed to have sent you on this massive journey to where you are today. So am I misremembering that? Or do you want to give a little thumbnail sketch of how you got kicked onto this path in life? Yeah. So I think really my path started in 2004 when I started teaching this course on energy and the environment. And I came in very eager to learn what our brilliant future would look like as a technologist, basically. And I had the same sort of dreamy eyed uh, appearance that many of our people in our society have. Uh, I was just excited to to dig in and learn more and realize it's not easy. Um, I realized, you know, our whole growth growth paradigm is, is whack. Um, my colleague, Kim Greist, had um, uh, shared with me this tidbit that in at, at the current rate of of growth in energy, we would be consuming all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, 100 billion stars worth of energy within, you know, a few thousand years. I thought, holy cow, that's so obviously that doesn't happen. And so this is important. Let's pay attention to this. So I was tuned into these things and in fact became ever more uh, concerned. And every every time I looked in detail at something, the answer was not as easy as it sounds. And I experimented. I built a, an off-grid photovoltaic system. And, you know, I've been a, a, a fan of that technology, but also recognize how difficult it is when you don't have a grid there that has base load power. And, you know, it's it's storage is a, a beast and it's never perfect. And, and there, there are a lot of inefficiencies involved. And so I was completely into that business and had started the Do the Math blog. Um, maybe a year before that conference where I was seated next to an economist. And and it was my fault. I thought, okay, I'm sitting, and I'd already seen his presentation at this at this conference. So I knew kind of he wasn't tuned in to this whole growth isn't forever story. So I, I sort of provoked it. I said, hey, you know, I'd like to talk to you about whether growth can last forever. And and I made a, a a bold statement that I knew he would react to, and then we, you know, it was game on. So, um, but it did reveal a lot of the sort of blind spots I think that neoclassical economists yeah. carry. And so I, I thought yeah. my reaction to the whole conversation was that it it's really almost ridiculous that professional, you know, prominent economists haven't even thought about these things that's the problem they just haven't even they're not it's not part of their horizon so yeah, yeah. one interesting thing like there's a difference between microeconomists where and for microecon there's a stopping rule whereas if you're you stop when your marginal revenue equals, equals your marginal cost and that's when you stop producing something but for macroeconomists there's no such stopping rule right it, it's it's right. you're always assuming Further growth is an essential part of the whole machine, um, which is which is interesting and strange, uh, especially that macroeconomic economics is supposed to be built on micro foundations, but but not there. So that, uh, I found that interesting. Yeah, it really should be microeconomics, mesoeconomics, which we now call macroeconomics, and there's no macroeconomics, at least as taught. And and part of the problem is that that. The, the whole hierarchy is is inverted. It's wrong that economists try to internalize everything or or 
assume that it could be made such that the economy is everything and you could st stuff the environment inside of it somehow. Mm -hmm. And you, you just can't do that. And so there is no macro economics because what's macro is the world and the environment. And you're not going to get the economy to include all of that. The economy has to be a subset of that. Right. So it can never be, there can never really be a macro economics. So I'm curious to know maybe with this specific individual or other conversations similarly that you've had over the years, I mean, <clears throat> To me, my background's in environmental engineering and science, and so having a sort of energy and materials and resource based picture of the economy is that's like very natural to me as, as in contrast to like the picture you're describing that most like mainstream economists hold. Have you had any luck like talk you know do they go, oh, you know what you're right, actually, a lot of our models and assumptions are a problem now that you pointed out. From this perspective have you had has anybody been converted or like what normally happens do people just have to pull back within the boundaries of their discipline and say this is just an exogenous thing that's not my problem or like what are the typical responses well so there are definitely economists who do get converted who who do step back and say oh my god this this can't work and often what that means is they leave the field <laughs> you know it just doesn't there's no room for them uh in, in that world uh, but others seek out little refuges, uh, like at the University of Vermont. There's a you know ecological economics kind of stronghold in a few other places uh, in the world. Um, and you know, I I was told that um, Kate Rayworth, for instance, who created this donut economics model, um, had read my my work and the you know the sort of growth can't last business and and the report is it, it blew her mind so i don't know how influential that kind of thing was but certainly there are economists who um do recognize that their story has been too limited and that there's a, a larger context and and some of them do something about it um and and, and change directions and start uh you know, battling the neoclassical ideas. So yeah, that that is known to happen. Mm. So let's go over some of the, you know, if, you know, from the economist point of view, the argument of continued growth, uh, let's go over some of that those arguments and, you know, why you think they're, they're flawed. So one argument is that, is this idea of ephemeralization, right? Where, well, growth is going to change its nature. Uh, we're going to grow. Um, the economy is going to be powered by services or something, right? That that require less energy and material throughput, and somehow we can kind of keep doing that for a long time. Uh, there's also some people who kind of take this view that uh, growth can become regenerative in some way, where if you start giving value to nature, if you start giving value to a broader array of things, then growth can mean, you know, more carbon sequestration, or it can mean, you know, whatever, more, more uh, topsoil. Uh, and it's just about getting the, you know, the prices right or something. Uh, those are two that just come to my mind off the top of my head. Do you want to, uh, I don't know, talk about those? Yeah, so you know, when it comes to dematerialization and decoupling, that's that's often um, you know a, a shiny uh, a topic among economists. And I will say one thing that it's similar to the the fact that I I take great delight in that that racists hate to be called racist, and it's funny to me that 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 they know that that's not good and they don't want want that label mm -hmm. and likewise th this focus on dematerialization and and decoupling is an admission that those are important things that um that we can't it, it's it's some sort of sideways uh uh acknowledgement that we can't keep growing forever and that it has to something has to change and but but what they're doing is saying well, we don't want to give up growth, so we need to concoct some way in which we we could continue growth. And since materials and energy things are problems, so obviously 
that's why it's the change. And so it tells you what the master is, you know, that growth, growth is the master and, you know, the materials and energy will just have to work itself out. And that will obviously have to look like dematerialization and decoupling because that's the only way to continue growth. And, and it's not really questioning uh, whether growth will continue. It's, it's an insistence that growth will continue. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a tantrum, I would say these, these ideas. Um, and, and it's not realized, um, you know, you can, you can find all kinds of reports of decoupling in say a European country, but that's because they're exporting all of their materials and labor manufacturing, et cetera, out of their borders. And so it can look like, oh yeah, look, we're using less energy. Yeah. Cause you know, China's doing your manufacturing for you. So, you know, you need to count their energy. And so um materials you know is, is so completely correlated with economic activity that there's, there's just been no uh real dematerialization it's only ever grown year by year our material uh dependencies and so you know there's no proof in the pudding there it's it's just all uh fantasy and um and i don't see how of order 8 billion people, 10 billion people uh, can possibly continue the lifestyles that we've become used to in the Western world. Um, and in fact, most people in the world are not living that lifestyle. And so even just to get to that lifestyle among all these people requires just this enormous um, environmental uh, sort of footprint that we just simply can't support because we're not supporting the current footprint that you know everything ecologically is in decline almost across the board uh forests and populations of animals and species and extinctions and so uh it's quite obviously not working even at this scale and so um getting everybody to the standard is is just out of the question uh everybody who's alive today so that just isn't going to happen and and uh we need to face that so yeah I have it. so um i guess what uh, where i want to drill down a little bit with you tom is um to look at different strategies like like this is this seems to be like a straightforward calamity that we face and the i mean it's it's, it's not at all simple to to comprehend or to solve but it is straightforward in the sense of the first step being recognize that current ways are are not going to be able to continue forward for for much longer we don't know how much longer or whatever and um you know you you've worked at a university for many years you have a you know a, a very successful academic career you know that system in and out can you talk a little bit about barriers to the kind of changes that we need to be making that come from like large institutions and maybe they're inertia or maybe like uh, or maybe if they're in conflict of interest situations or, you know, I, from my, in my field, I feel like it's hard. It would be hard to get funding to do kind of research and activity in the vein, I think, that we need. Like in my field, it's much more like we recognize that fossil fuels are unsustainable. So let's invent new technologies for cars or whatever. It's just like invent new things to do to take the place of old things that we've come to depend on rather than questioning like. Is this even a mode that we want to perpetuate, perpetuate let alone can per perpetuate? So, talk, so I mean, where where do you think are insertion points or leverage points or or obstacles to be avoided? You know, specifically looking at the university, to what extent can universities be kind of transformed in the coming years to start to address our calamities more head on? And taking the first step, of acknowledging that a lot of what we've done so far is not working, and we have to change. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that that nobody's really asking those bigger picture questions and the universities at this point are just in service of the machine. The machine is demanding uh, employees um, to do the kinds of things that make money. And, you know, it's, it's a market system and the universities are just part of that market. Mm -hmm. uh, the universities are not attempting to train students to be just broad thinkers. You know, the 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 training is very responsive to market demands. And in fact, when criticized by 
some large employer or some you know trade industry when the universities are criticized that you know they're not preparing the students to do the things they need the universities don't say that's not our job our job is to you know train students to be able to think critically or what that's not what they say they say oh no we actually are doing what you want to do and and you know behind the scenes they're going to try to get better at doing those things and you know it makes a lot of sense that's just the system that we're we're uh, that we've constructed and if you ask students what they want out of a university education it isn't to be able to think critically and be broad minded and have a you know a, a solid education it's they want a job mm -hmm. and that's i i've polled students over the years you know i've asked the question why are you in college and I would give them, you know, I used in class clickers so I could get kind of real time feedback. And, um, you know, I would I would have to get a, a job, um, you know, family pressures, just the default course. What else am I going to do? Um, right. uh, you know, partying um, and and learning and, you know, about 10, 15 percent would want to learn. They're there to learn. Uh, but like 50 percent would pick the job route. And mm -hmm. it's just overwhelming that that's or, or default course or family pressures. But, you know, the learning wasn't the, the big deal. So, you know, in that market system. Colleges and universities are going to cater to what the students want. Right. I mean, I'd say I don't totally entirely blame the students for for responding that way, because, as you know, like the price of higher education has gone up so much and student loans are such a, a huge burden for so many people. I mean, you could say, I just want to learn. I want to do something idealistic. I want to dedicate my life to the service of the poor or something like that. And you could have all those kind of values. Mm -hmm. But if you come out of college with many, many tens of thousands of dollars of debt, you're like, well, you got it. You're going to have to go work for a consulting firm or something to at least hope to be able to pay that down. So right. to a certain extent, there's a kind of trap involved. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I don't want to come off blaming the students. I'm just kind of illustrating that from both sides, from the sort of global you know machine system the the market and uh, and the students themselves that from both sides the universities have pressures to to satisfy on the job front and so that, that's what they do um that's the business model so so yeah um i mean you do have professors who might care a lot about the learning aspect but they're also somewhat trapped in 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 the system so yeah i think for myself as a uh you know I, I just retired actually from from my career as a physicist and astrophysicist because it just didn't work for me anymore i i couldn't reconcile you know spending my time doing things that i think would be you know sort of sort of pointless and while i had the freedom to maybe do different things and so this is maybe a good illustration that you know, here I am, I have different interests, I have tenure, I have, you know, got it made. Um, and, and as long as I'm having an impact in some way, uh, as judged by the university, they'll be happy with with uh, my status. Um, and I could, I could certainly maybe arrange to have impact, but it would be really hard to get funding to do the kinds of things I want to do. There's no money in sort of uh, winding down modernity. <laughs> that? who's going to pay for that um and and my colleagues simply wouldn't understand what i was doing and why and so that's a really difficult environment to be in we are social creatures we care about the people around us and how they respond to what we're doing and well some do i do um maybe some people just really don't care and um you know we know who who those kinds of people are but um it just would have been a very difficult existence to be such an outsider un you know mi misunderstood by by everybody around you and what you know why are you taking up space here we could hire somebody who's doing black hole mergers if you would just get out of the way um mm -hmm. so i just didn't want to be there yeah so our our university system doesn't really make room in the professional sense for explorers who want to try something you know way outside of the the confines of what they're expected to do 
notwithstanding all the marketing around like, like that's, you know, we're, we're hiring these explorers to think critically and go into new territory. But that's kind of fake, though, <laughs> to be honest, because then you're doing that and you're like, ah, oh, I feel alienated now. And I and there's not, you know, that's that's kind of a wh- while we're on this, I want to pose a kind of a two parter to you. So if you were so, you know, you have a lot of experience, you have a critical perspective on higher ed and academia now and research and education. If you were a dictator of the country and you could refashion, resize or do whatever you want to the higher education system, you know, what would that look like? What would you do? And that's part A. And part B is, well, you're not a dictator and you're, you know, you're not going to be able to enact that vision. So what do you think is sort of the likely future of the sort of near and medium term future of uh, the higher ed system? Is it going to collapse under its own weight? Is it um, you're just what I don't want to I don't want to uh, bias it. Just what you know, what would be your vision if you could control everything and what what it was your expectations of what's likely to happen? Yeah, good question. And it's something I haven't thought a lot about because I have no plans to be dictators. So I, um, <laughs> I haven't spent much time thinking about it, but I think it would be radical no matter what. I mean, it would be um, a complete rethinking so that it's not. It it would be no longer sort of market driven, and it wouldn't be sort of uh, part of a treadmill toward toward jobs. Um, and it would be for the select people who are driven to learn. Um, I think you know vo- vocational schools maybe would be the the path for people who just want to be a plumber or you know have some steady income or even doctors. That's a vocation, so like they don't need higher education; they just need to you know, learn a lot of stuff, um, but it's very, very focused. So I, but I kind of think that systemized, systematized education itself is something of a problem. That humans of all ages are natural learners. And as long as they have the environment and the resources and the access to, you know, people who can help show them the way, uh, it just sort of takes care of itself uh, at some level. So I'm not even sure that our structured educational system is even a good thing. Um, I mean, kids love to learn and they're super curious and and you can't stop them asking why until you put them in school. <laughs> and, and like within a few years, they they just, what they learn is to pass the time and just get through it and sit in their desk and, you know, look forward to recess and whatever else. But, um, but it, it's a system that doesn't actually encourage learning um, as a, as a natural curious phenomenon. So yeah, if I were a dictator, I might abolish the educational system um, and, and try to work out something more organic and something more, uh, more natural. But I think what to the second part of your question, what's actually going to happen is I think something of a, a, a fading away as with many of our institutions, um, you know, as we, we built this entirely, utterly complex system that is drowning under its own weight in a sense and um and we're going to see a lot of simplifications and a lot of you know decomplexifying uh kinds of uh moves not because that's what people want but because it's no longer supportable and i think higher education will be one of those things that uh like so many things will desperately try to cling on to its, you know, former uh, mode, but it will be unsuccessful in the end. So I think it's just something that withers along with so many other institutions. And so I don't think I need to, as a dictator, I wouldn't need to abolish the system. It will do that to itself in time. So another another two parts question, kind of related, uh, more personal. So you said you're retiring because you don't have the institutional support to pursue the projects that you think would be important. Uh, if you did have that support, what projects 
what research projects would you personally be interested in pursuing? And second part of the question is now that you are retiring, what's next? What, what, how do you want to spend your time uh, going forward? Yeah, so, you know, th those two, the answers are almost the same to those two, because what I would do as research, uh, if I had the support, is basically what I'm going to do anyway, um, which is continue to think in this space and talk with others and explore and learn um, uh, new ideas, new ways of thinking. Um, I, you know, may maybe as a an indicator, the things that I'm exploring lately are um, the ways that we think, the ways that our, our brain works and why we get trapped in certain ways of, of thinking and how, uh, you know, the kind of abstracted, decontextualized, linear, analytic, algorithmic mode that we get trapped in uh, is not to our advantage. That's, it's great for technology, but it's not um it's it's not um integrated into the the whole into the real world as we know it it doesn't respect change in relationships and ambiguity and things that are that are real and surrounding us so i'm interested in exploring that i'm interested in exploring indigenous ways of thinking and i'm just dipping a toe into that but i'm i'm really impressed that that there are uh, a lot of common philosophies among indigenous groups internationally. So this is just sort of an emergent property that a lot of these very successful, time-tested, long, uh, long-lasting cultures have arrived at similar conclusions on what it takes to live in that way. And some of the common threads that I'm very attracted to are humility, um, you know, it's the opposite of human supremacy and anthropocentrism. Um, it's it's um, a respect for and an awe for all life and um, and recognition that we're just part of a larger ecosystem and that we're not it's it's masters and that we can learn a lot from our older brothers and sisters, the plants and animals that have been around much longer than we have and can teach us a lot of things. So those things really resonate with me of late and i want to learn more um i i have come to the conclusion that well and, and this is something that I, I think really helped me recently to recognize that all of my anguish over what I saw as a, a looming collision and train wreck between modernity and, and its growth imperative and then finite planetary limits. You know, what, I spent over a decade just deeply concerned about what, what this means. And I made the mistake that so many people make, which is conflating modernity with humanity and thinking that a failure of modernity is a failure of humanity. Mm -hmm. But I no longer think that. Partly because, obviously, humans have been around on the planet for much longer than modernity has been. It's a very recent hobby of ours and doesn't define who we are. It's not baked in. It's not in our DNA. And so um, I can now focus my attention on, okay, so let's write off modernity as something that was never, never could have gone on indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and focus on what it means to be human and how how to uh, live as humans on this planet. And so I think that's where my focus is. That's where my my interests are. That's what I would want to learn more about. It's not a hard science. Um, you know, all of my preparation and skills are almost useless um, when it comes to addressing uh, questions at the scale. Although, you know, certainly the the ability to think critically came through that channel of learning physics and astrophysics. Um, but but the main thing here, and this is why I'm interested in kind of mental modes, is to branch out and be a little less analytic and a little less um, rigid in how to approach these problems. Speaking of modernity, do you think that any of modernity 
can and should be salvaged, whether it's on the technological side, um, whether it's on, say, the public health side or even on like social cultural systems. I don't know. I'm thinking like the concept of human rights seems to be pretty associated with modernity, for example. Uh, do, do, do you see anything in modernity that can and should be salvaged or reformed? Yeah, I, and I've thought a little bit about this. Um, my my gut reaction is just, is to say throw it all out because you know it led to a lot of bad things. Um, but that's that's unrealistic and it's <clears throat> not very helpful. So I do think that there are uh, benefits to what we've learned in modernity, and and I can see some peaceful coexistence between some of the modern uh, uh, approaches and and what I would see as an ecologically responsible way to live. And one of those, you know, touching on something close to my heart, science. I mean, I've been a scientist all my life. And I think by and large, science has been used to further the machine and, the, you know, the um, further modernity. So most of it has been misspent. OK, um, most scientific efforts um, focused on what can we do that's uh, fun for humans in the short term. Um, or good in some sense for humans only in the short term. But science, when it comes down to it, is is about careful observation. And or that's a, a central piece of it. And that's something that's always been a part of being human. Mm -hmm. And I think, but but we refined some of it. And I do think that um, there are definitely lines of scientific inquiry that can help us be good citizens of this planet by carefully looking at say ecosystems and understanding the relationships and um, what different things drive different outcomes and behaviors. So I, I do feel that we, the question I always ask is what would be a net benefit to the community of life, to the larger ecological uh, scene and what, what's a net harm? So science can definitely be used in the net benefit mode. Um, so that's one thing. I think even just knowing that I, I, I would like not to forget about evolution. Um, I would like not to forget about, you know, cl close to home for me, how the universe came to be here. And so those stories, as far as we know, are correct. Um, and so it can be woven into a mythology, but a mythology that's on a very solid foundation. And I would like that knowledge to, to persist. So those are maybe just a couple of the things, just careful observation and and some of the some of what we've learned. When it comes to human rights, um, those we have to realize are complete fabrications. We just we we claim rights because we want those things um and then we squabble over what rights we actually have and that's what politics comes down to is some people claim we have a right to have guns or abortions or whatever and so you know r rights are a very tricky issue and i think they're not to be thrown out entirely but what i would want to do is extend that to more than humans and as long as, you know, it's the human and human rights that gives me shivers, um, you know, what about the life rights? And and we're just one of many life forms. And so uh, claiming all the rights for ourselves is not ecologically responsible. I want to ask you about um, a topic that I find myself circling around a lot in recent years that is relevant to this line of thinking. And that question I wonder about is what uh, what's the role of religion and religious traditions? Because one way to conceptualize our polycrisis in modernity is we've come to view any sort of limitations put on satisfying human needs and desires, you know, for transportation or for foods from all over the world or whatever, we see limits as being kind of an inherent bad, a desire to overcome them often through the application of technology or social limits through, you know, through policies, for example, to boost human rights and to, and 
a lot of limitations clearly are bad things. If, if a person is a slave, their freedom is limited. That's obviously a bad thing. But this drive, I would say like the, you know, you, you're, you, you've come at it like growth can't go on forever. And I also feel like, you know, an indefinite series of breaking down barriers and breaking down limits is going to induce a lot of the same kind of, you know, cat- catastrophic things as, as trying to grow forever. And it seems to me that throughout, you know, in different places around the world, different times in history, religious traditions have played a role of kind of a break on human appetites. And it may be for reasons that are that we would consider superstitious or like it's a myth. It's not a scientific fact or whatever. But it's but like go back to the the Genesis in the Garden of Eden. And God said, you can eat all from these trees, but don't eat from that tree. We don't eat from that tree. Right. And there's no real like what's why what's what's there's no reason. It's not like, okay, science says you can't eat from that tree. It was just stated. And it's like we just don't do that. You know, so do you foresee that like. And and I feel like another characteristic of, of modernity, especially secular modernity, is like religion is stupid. It's an impediment. It's superstitious. It creates all this injustice and causes people to fight and stuff. We need to just throw it away and get rid of it. But I kind of see it as possibly an integral thing to the human ecosystem. And when we try to throw it away, then we have all these kind of problems that we're facing now. So do you kind of foresee that there might be like a resurgence in interest in religious traditions or do you see a role there going forward? Or are you kind of talking about the emergence of a new kind of ecological consciousness, something that's totally new out of the situation? And it's more like a a, a set of narratives and understandings about the world and humans place in the world that is essentially just informed by like biology, chemistry, physics, ecology. And that's a sort sort of in a, in a way, kind of a new religion. Or do you see continuation with, with faith traditions of the past? Yeah. So good question. And I, I think, you know, a little from column A and a little from column B in that I think there will be new emergent spiritualities that come out of whatever chaos we're going to face and i do think it could weave together some of the very old traditions uh maybe you know hopefully some of the indigenous uh traditions and spiritual uh mythologies uh but tempered with some of the um you know some things from modernity i think there's that's somewhat unavoidable you know we're not going to be able to design any of these things they're just going to happen somehow um, and so I think there will be a blend and some new things along with it. Um, and I think you're right that r- some religious traditions in the last, you know, even a few hundred years ago um, would would sort of preach a moderation and, um, and a, a certain kind of humility under God, but that humility still uh, manifested in how we, we behave. So I think they're definitely useful things there. Uh, my main beef with the religions of the last few thousand years is that they are uh, they reinforce human supremacy that it that they all sort of put put humans at the top well under maybe a, a deity but still on earth we have dominion over earth and so forth. And so I think those are deeply problematic. Whereas the religion of, say, animism, I think, is much more uh, productive and useful in terms of of moving the right kinds of relationships, motivating the right kinds of relationships with other animals and being, you know, having that humility not under God, but under like the umbrella of the community of life and being a a, a part of that and not its masters. Um, One thing that I will say to the point of abolishing or you know the the impulse to say this is a very problematic uh piece and we need to get rid of it um i realized at one point because i i have said things like that in the past um and i realized several years ago that that was inconsistent with some other observation of mine which is something i call the libertarian fallacy and i don't want to necessarily get political but I've known a lot of libertarians who are incredibly smart people and they're, they've got sharp minds and they basically, um, you know, to, to mangle the, the point that, you know, 
and, and paraphrase it, basically, I don't need laws to behave well. You know, I'm going to behave responsibly and well in society. And so we we don't really need all these 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 uh, you know this infrastructure and these these uh, rigid laws because you know people are going to be okay. And the fallacy there is to believe that everybody is like you and similarly smart and sharp and seeing things the same way. And maybe it would be true if everybody were kind of carbon copies of, of that, that model, but that's not reality. And so why this is relevant to religion is I, I caught myself realizing that I don't need religion to be a moral person and to be, you know, uh, kind and to be whatever, all these virtues that you might attribute to religion. Um, it's not fear of hell that makes me, you know, not murder people. It's that I don't want to, and I don't, you know, I, that's, that's abhorrent to me. And so, um, as an atheist, I, I felt like I was often living more, um, uh, kindly and morally than a lot of Christians that I know. And I grew up in a very Christian environment and saw a lot of hypocrisy and whatever. And so, but I realized that I was doing the same thing, the same fallacy that, yeah, just because I don't happen to need religion doesn't mean that most humans or many humans don't. And since it's always been a part of human life in some form, it's really arrogant to think, or or, or I just think it, it doesn't, it's unrealistic to think that religion is not going to be a part of humans and uh, of human life and human culture. So then the question is, what kind of religious traditions um, result in sort of ecological sustainability that that's what i keep coming down to because that's what modernity isn't and that is why it will not work and so the only things that work for the long term by definition must be ecologically sustainable and if they're not it's it's not interesting so what religious um rather than dispensing with religion what kind of religious uh um belief systems would be ecologically sustainable that that would be interesting for me to explore for, I, I would I would be interested in reading about that. One word that I find invoked a lot um, among some Christians and, and others as well is this idea of stewardship. Um, so not domination, uh, more of like accepting the human role of certain capacities that human humans have to be a net good, you know, for the community of life, as you say. Um, and that, you know, perhaps might be, I mean, it's it's something that, I, you know, it's, a, it's an idea that kind of inspires me of like, okay, can humans, you know, we're, we're obviously a powerful species in, ter in terms of having the capacity to destroy life on earth. Um, do we also have a capacity to be a keystone species in order to uh, regenerate life on earth or at least get out of the way? Um, you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point to bring up and i would definitely prefer stewardship over mastery um and and what we're what we're attempting right now which obviously will not work um and so it's a i think a step in the right direction but it does still strike me as being arrogant mm -hmm. and um also just recognizing that for most of evolutionary history humans were not part of the story and things got along just fine and so the natural world does not require or need or want um, a human presence as as stewards or overseers. Now, can we play that role? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Um, and, you know, if if applied in a way that's truly respectful of other life and doesn't prioritize humans over uh, the rest of the community, I think that's fine. But the word does uh, concern me a little bit because it, it it's an elevation of, you know, into a special role that I think is 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 a bit of self-importance and not necessarily ecologically grounded. Yeah. So, so what do you think about um, um, 
so if I understand you right, where you're you're advocating a, a change in how we view ourselves as humans, you know, not as this kind of supreme species lording over the world, but as a humble, you know, member of this overall biotic community. And, you know, I, I concur with that uh, a great deal, if not completely. Um, and the question is, how do we get there from here? Because now we have, you know, big cities and mega technology and 8 billion people. And um, there's a transition period. Like, I don't think you can kind of go overnight to say, OK, everybody now just start being humble. You know, that, that, that and actually like, I, you know, I in many ways so so maybe the stewardship idea is kind of a transitional mode or something like that because i do feel like we do need to be quite aggressive about a lot of things like i put to, i'm a i'm a fan of agroecology and regenerative agriculture methods as a sort of you know antidote to the industrial farming system that that can't be sustainable and so i personally feel like you know we we do need many people moving aggressively in the direction of agriculture or uh, agroecology and regenerative ag and stuff like that. And that's, that's very much a, you know, like, like, is it with our presence and the weight that we place on the biosphere now, you know, we can't just sort of abdicate our position in favor of adopting, you know, going right to this humility stage, but rather we have to have a, okay, we're going to have to engineer our way out of the mess we've created. And that does mean, you know, taking the reins and being the kind of superior species, but with the aim of of, of directing our, our, our mode of travel into the future into ways that are environmentally benign from where we are. Yeah, you make a good point. Nothing's going to happen um, automatically. And I, I'm, I've mixed, I'm of two minds in this, I guess, um, in that I recognize in myself that I made a huge change in my lifetime. And so it is possible for individuals to um, radically adjust their own kind of worldview. And that's at the base of what we do and all of our decisions. And so I feel like uh, that's not impossible. We are capable of such things. But I, I also recognize that it's not going to happen that way. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cultural inertia and um and then the other sort of flipping back and forth like a yo-yo here but um recognizing that I, I i like to think of since i'm a technical person and i've dealt with computers uh all my life in the you know low level hardware and and assembly code and and sophisticated high level software and operating systems that you know we have hardware that is what it is we that that's part of our dna we're you know a baby is going to come out with certain hardware and and um that gives them certain capabilities um but the the software hasn't yet been installed the operating system hasn't yet been installed uh in a newborn and that's what culture does it installs the software and so we basically get a reset with every baby this is an uninstalled package um and so things can shift pretty quickly um and, and so, you know, in 100 years, 1,000 years, the, the child that's born and at those times, uh, to, to them, everything around them is normal, and they're going to have a completely different operating system. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree that there has to be a transition, and we can't hit the reset across, you know, 8 billion people. Uh, there's going to be a lot of continuity, and, you know, where do those operating systems get installed from from the parents and so there's a lot of inertia that sort of carries those things over as conditions change you know the, those um you know it's it's not uncommon for kids to be told one thing by their parents but the reality they see doesn't match that and so they end up writing their own operating system to deal with the circumstances as they see them not as their parents wish to see them so that's going to happen and it's very complex but in the end you know you've got 8 billion people here, let's say time is running this way, you've got 8 billion people, and eventually that's got to get down to some small thing. I'm not going to put a number on it, but it's much smaller than 8 billion people to be sustainable and be part of the community of life. And going from one to the other uh, might be fairly rapid. We don't know. I mean, it could take, you know, decades, centuries, or millennia, let's say. But if it's if it's rapid, you know, that bottleneck is going to be turbulent. 
And there's just no easy way to go from here to here. And whether we go through this, you know, what I would call uh, in physics speech, adiabatic process of a slow evolution um, from one state to the other, it would be great if we have time for that. Um, my suspicion is that it will not work that way. And the reason I suspect it will not work that way is because we will not monolithically get on board with, okay, now our program is to do this. A lot of people are going to be like, no, we want to stay here. Or we want to grow or whatever. And so the, the system will continue to try to operate as it is and resist these major changes and moving into stewardship. And so, but the thing to realize is that that it's it's not it is not monolithic and that some people will do those other paths and we don't need to worry about getting all eight billion people on the same track we just need to make sure that some tracks lead in useful directions even if the the main track never gets the memo and just kind of does itself in i mean that's just what can you do about that yeah well, that's a big theme on this podcast is recognizing the doom, which it usually revolves around biophysical realities. Um, I think we're in line there. Um, and then it's okay. So what do we, what do we do now besides curl up in a ball and uh, you know, become fatalistic and uh, whatever else. Uh, and so it's, you know, we're constantly trying to think about, okay, we can think societally, what would be new societal arrangements, but also if we're being realistic in our own lives, what can we do? How, how can we think about, okay, what do I, what, what do I do the next day um, to, you know, carve out this new, new potential track that you're talking about? Um, do you want to talk one about maybe about a little bit more about timeline? Like are, are is your timeline kind of like, in the next decade, there's going to be things are going to hit a wall, or is it more like a century timeline? And related to that, you know, what are what are some ways that people have changed how they live that you find inspiring and that, that you think might be, you know, could gain momentum? Yeah. Okay. So on the first point, I'm heavily influenced by the limits to growth work from 1972. Um, and it's not something I take literally, neither did the people who wrote it take it literally. What they pointed out was that we have discovered some fairly robust dynamical modes in the system that are fairly, you know, that impervious to our changing our assumptions and that we tend to see a collapse in the 21st century sometime. Um, I have no strong reason to discredit you know or doubt that overall point of view and and part of it is that they recognized a, a very critical uh, piece to the story which is that anytime you have delays and negative feedback then you'll get overshoot and collapse and it's not at all hard to point to delays and negative feedback in our system i mean decades long delays just in human lifetimes are decades long. And so, you know, when a baby is born, they, their impact is going to stretch out over many decades. And so all of the sort of negatives and pollution that come along with supporting that, that person in Western uh, uh, modern way uh, will play out for a long time. And so there's, we have lots of those negative, delayed negative uh, feedback. So I think that does speak to somewhat inevitable overshoot, which I would say we're well into. Um, and the fact that the the data since, you know, over 50 years has tracked pretty well their models. And, you know, th there's a tendency among economists, especially to say, well, that's been debunked, you know, long ago. And how have you, have you seen the future? Have you, have we gone past the peak? And you can say that, no, that never happened. Uh, so I have a lot of reason to, to, believe that and not not only just that model okay it, it's it's that if you look at the ecological trends 
and species uh, extinctions and population declines and, you know, 70% average decline in vertebrate populations in my lifetime, you know, it's, it's serious. Uh, now down to the point of two and a half kilograms of wild land mammal mass per person on the planet. So think about that. You can tag yourself to about five and a half pounds, two and a half kilograms of a wild mammal mass. And that's all you've got. Um, it's almost down to nothing. You know, it's, it's like, was it Grover Norquist's statement about the government that, you know, he wants it to be small enough to drown it in a bathtub. Well, we've now got the wild land mammal mass down to small enough we can drown it in a bathtub. We're almost done. We're, we've almost wiped it out and we're, we're this close and we're probably going to do it well. So there are a lot of trends that look extremely dire. What I tend to think is that I would, I frame it this way. I would be surprised if we sort of undergo a collapse in the next decade. Um, I would be probably equally surprised if we can hold off to something like 2080 without seeing some major disruptions and some, you know, major simplifications. That's a long window, a 50 year window. And I'm prepared to be surprised, right? I don't have all the answers. Uh, never underestimate the, the, um, incentives to keep this system going and kick the can down the road and so i could easily be surprised by wow we made it to 2150 holy cow you know who would have thought but but it becomes increasingly improbable in my mind so i do, that, do you that's think, a long do long range it's just a, do you see more like energy availability kind of powering the whole thing or the ecosystem collapse as as kind of a, a more immediate kind of threat to human life support systems. Yeah, good question. I, I definitely started thinking about this in terms of energy, mm -hmm. uh, but lately I'm shifting more to ecology. But the thing is that's such a complex system. I have a difficult time. That's part of our problem. Actually, we we don't understand how it works and all the interrelationships. And so I, I can't paint, uh, you know, anything like an accurate picture for how that plays out other than just to recognize that that can't work, you know, in the end it can't work and it's going to fall apart sometime. I mean, at when insects are being lost at one or 2% per year, that's such a foundational part of the food web. Mm -hmm. uh, and all life depends on it in some way that, you know, agriculture can fail because of some microbial uh, problem in the soils or, you know, it's just, it's too complex and we just can't, we can't predict it. So, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I sort of throw up my hands there and just say, I can recognize what working means versus not working in the current system is not working because the trends are decidedly bad and it's not clear, you know, renewable energy doesn't reverse those trends. It might affect CO2, but it doesn't mm -hmm. do a thing to ecological trends. Um, Last year was the highest amount of CO2 emitted globally yet, um, even yeah. though renewables have been growing pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 So the second part you asked about changes that can be done and what changes I do see. Um, I, at first, I guess my reaction, because I was focused on energy, is what can I change in my life around energy use and being less, um, you know, having a smaller footprint? And I made a lot of changes in terms of home heating and transportation and diet and, um, and those things do matter. I, I cut my footprint down by a, a large factor, um, you know, factor four and five on the things I have direct control over. I don't have direct control over the fact that I'm in a society that, you know, runs street lights all night and that has a military and air conditions its theaters. You know, I don't have mm. all, all, all full control, but, but the things that I do have control over, I, I reduce quite a lot. And found that it's relatively easy and satisfying and, and felt that, you know, we could really buy ourselves some time by doing that. What I've found in the process when talking to other people is that 
people are almost offended when you cross the line of their personal comfort. Um, and when you talk about how, you know, what they set the thermostat to, that becomes a deeply personal thing or what they eat um, and, and, and how often they shower, you know, that's, that's really hard to, to change um, those kinds of habits and expectations. Lately, I think more on the bigger picture of not just the energy side, but um, more about who we are as humans on the planet in relation to other life and um, recognizing modernity as the wrong answer that can't continue. And so the changes that I'm more interested in now are changes where people are basically walking away from modernity and saying, this isn't the right system. I don't want to play. And I feel like that's the beginning of the right kind of change because we're not going to change. I guess part of the problem with modernity is that it's a, a top-down kind of mentality. What can we do to change the system? And if I were a dictator, what would I do? And I just feel like um, that is definitely the mode that we tend to think about um, to, to sort of steer the whole tanker ship and make monolithic changes. But I think the reality is that the the, the real changes, the effective changes are going to come from people who splinter off of that and decide not to play. Mm. And so I, I, I want to, I want to ask you about this. I thought you made a really interesting point that you often will experience. If you start to talk about aspects of people's personal comfort or convenience and calling them into question that there's a reaction like, Hey, you're taking something away from me or you're, you're implying that I need to sacrifice something or whatever. Uh, you went from there to describe, um, you know, the possibility of a lot of people just recognizing the the pitfalls of of walking a typical course in in, in modernity culture and are just opting out and opting for something different. So if we take this idea of of encouraging opting out, what like what do you see are some good strategies or tactics or how do you have examples or case studies because i feel like rather than say hey 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 you should sacrifice you know change ch change the setting on your thermostat or whatever that's taking something away but say like actually there's a lot of enriching opportunities available when you opt out of the main system and opt in to like a you know a more ecological worldview and the activities that are involved in that so do you have some positive examples or do you have some strategies or an idea like you're not a dictator imposing from top down, but you're like an outsider saying, hey, come over here. This is actually really great what we can do. And it can be potentially be so much more sustainable than that thing over there. How do you attract people in it to opt out like that? Yeah. And that that is how I would see it is that you're trying to siphon off people from that that system and you're not going to change that system. It's it's going to evolve the way it does. And and, uh, you know presumably wither. Um, yeah. And so I guess I, I'm living part of that in that I retired, I'm, I'm 53. And it's a financial risk to retire that early. It's not very cushy. <laughs> um, but that's okay. Why does it need to be? My needs are modest. Um, and I've got, I'm very lucky that I have a wife who's you know, on board. Um, she's not on board to the extent that I am. She she is very tolerant of these things and understands the rationale, but um, but she's not really deeply invested in these these thoughts and ideas the way I am. Uh, but but I'm very lucky there that that I've got a partner who will journey. You know, take this journey with me. Um, but. I think it's it's easier for me to do because I've had a career. I don't I know I don't know what to say to younger people who are disillusioned with modernity and want to do something differently, but but can't. And I'm also trapped to some extent. I mean, I'm still you see in the background, I'm in a house and I'm in, you know, have a computer and, you know, um, so I'm still very much a product of and a participant in modernity. Um, when I grapple with that and grapple with the, the fact that I can't 
direct people to an immediate, you know, um, gratifying lifestyle away from modernity. Uh, it's, I, I think of this quote that Vanessa uh, Andreotti had in her book, Hospicing Modernity. And it's, it's a story from Brazil um, that there's a saying that goes something like, if a flood is coming and you know it's coming, you know that you're going to have to swim. Um, but right now the water's only up to your ankles. So you can't just swim yet. You can't start swimming. And so we know that the end of modernity must come and we know that we're going to have to live differently, but the conditions aren't there yet for us to live differently. We just need to get ourselves mentally ready for that, uh, that reality that we see is coming. And, and we can do some good things in preparing ourselves psychologically and, and materially for, for a different world. Um, if I wanted to go full on kind of, uh, you know, adopt a way of life that is more ecologically sustainable as part of my ecological uh, setting, I'd be thrown in jail because I'd be violating property rights. Um, and so that's one of the elements of modernity that really traps us into playing by the current rules. And we can't just flop that and say, um, you know, I'm dropping out and I'm going to live the way I want to live. There are laws against doing that. So we, we are a bit trapped. Um, the homeless, in some to some extent, are, I mean, they're living off the, the crumbs, I guess, and the, the sort of excesses of modernity, but they've at least dropped out. And that's an interesting uh, example of a maybe growing phenomenon of people who just say, I don't, I don't want to play this game. I would prefer to live in kind of a tribal community where they have each other's backs and they help each other and they support each other. And so they might find a lot of reward in some elements of the lifestyle, even though a lot of it obviously you know must suck too but but you know may, maybe we're starting to see more people just dropping out opting out hmm. they're Here. the ones swimming in the mud it's hard you know that, but they decided to start swimming even though it's not really quite there yet I'm, I'm i'm curious why you would get arrested to live your lifestyle is it because you there's a so somebody's somebody's property that you really like that you would squat on and and create a garden and pitch a well it's yeah it's just that the the land that i happen the the bank agrees that i own or whatever title what you know it's not enough to support me right. and do things i want and if i wanted to say um i'm not a hunter but if i wanted to live in a way that's more consistent with our distant past, you know, I would need to follow game into other people's properties, you know, and uh, that's with a gun or whatever, or a bow, that's a way to get thrown in jail. Um, so yeah, just that the, the, we're actually living in such high population densities and, and we have just so many people that that's another thing where we can't just uh drop our industrial agriculture overnight because you know that's a that's a fast route to starvation um but yeah those alternate modes just need more land base than 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 we have available to us as individuals at the moment i i'd like to comment on this question about the legality and the sort of like abiding by codes and stuff I feel actually kind of optimistic about this kind of thing because those kind of codes and directives you think in the extreme of like a um like a HOA that has really like egregious rules about your house or whatever and that kind of stuff I feel like can it only it doesn't really make sense but it can only make sense in a paradigm where everything is functioning mm -hmm. you know temporarily things are functioning so you can have those kind of rules and I think about things like you know I have I've had friends over the years who have like you know, gone to Detroit and bought, you know, property for almost nothing when it, the whole place is just like falling down. And yeah, technically they're all like, like they just were like, well, we need a toilet. So we're going to have to, and the toilets doesn't work. So we have to make a composting toilet, which would be totally illegal. But there was, but like, there was no one there to tell them not to do it. 
Mm-hmm. And, and and there was no even if the code office is like, oh, you can't do that, they can't police it. So I, I the, the optimism part for me is a sort of failure fixes itself a lot of times, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of the really extraneous rules and regulations will kind of fall away naturally when it's yeah. just people have to be practical, you know. So, I think I, so. I, yeah. yeah, I think it'll melt away. It's just that's a matter of how high is the water level and can you really start swimming? And so right now. Probably not, but yeah, I think I think ultimately a lot of that stuff just just does melt away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of conversations on this podcast about because a lot of us are are kind of inherently agrarians. We also have some new urbanists, and we kind of see a, a nice symbiosis of those two kinds of movements. Uh, and we talk a lot about you know even if there's kind of two issues with kind of an agrarian moving back towards agrarian vision is one is the demand like there's not a lot of people find that vision attractive or necessary uh and then the second is even if there was a demand you know where where would they get the land right most millennials are in debt they can't afford land so in our current political economy it's it's not a very viable option and so we have a lot of conversations about okay so what are some ways especially if you know suddenly things start seeming more fragile as a society and the need to say community food self-sufficiency seems more you know seems more salient all of a sudden you know how how would that how would that happen and and some people are kind of saying well you know there's a lot of older farmers who would want to see like the land to be stewarded well and so they could have relationships between young people and older people some people go more in direction of like land reform this needs to be like a policy change some people say well it would need to be like a grassroots community land trust kind of movement. Um, I'm I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, about, you know, I I assume that this assumption is wrong. Let me know, but that we will need to become more agrarian moving forward, more close, closely tied to the land and our kind of food and energy base. Uh, Do you see kind of, I don't know, or do you see like likely or potential pathways to get people back on land, access to land, you know, the training requirements to live this other lifestyle, right? You can't just like get plopped somewhere and expect to, you know, sustain yourself. Uh, most of us can anyway. Yeah, I, I'm curious if you have thoughts about about that. Um, not a whole lot, because I guess I take the, the liberty of thinking in longer term, um, you know, when, when I think about sustainability, I I tend to think in the, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of years uh, timeline because yeah. that's how long humans have been around, uh, even millions of years, humans in some form. So um, it's so easy to get distracted by, especially in this whirlwind kind of fireworks show right now, uh, our perspective is completely distorted about what life looks like. And the only thing I know is sustainable is not even agriculturally based. Mm-hmm. And so I think that we did take a big departure uh, 10,000 years ago when we started doing something like agriculture. And that might be just inherently unsustainable. That might be something that it's a slow road, but it's one that builds surpluses and and starts promoting growth. And I think most importantly, an attitude of of domination or mastery over the land. And it's not part of the evolutionary heritage in a sense. It's it's kind of built on top of that. And so it's not time tested. It's not um it's it's not obviously sustainable for long periods of time. And so I might be in the wrong space here uh thinking this way, but I do tend to think very long term. And so mm-hmm. I I guess the the thing I would say is that we basically tried two modes of living as humans on this planet. We tried hunter gatherer and we tried agricultural. Mm. And one lasted a lot longer than the other. Uh, that doesn't mean that those are the only two modes available. And so that's where maybe part of my optimism is and interest is in trying to think about what other or maybe blended forms of living might we imagine. And, you know, before agriculture, there was horticulture and there were people who were tending, you know, 
landscapes and plants, but not plowing fields and, you know, right. uh, I, I tend to out. like hunter horticulturalist as opposed to hunter gatherer because gatherer yeah. lies more past the relationship, which we know it wasn't a passive relationship. Right. Yeah. I like that. And, and I'm not an expert in any of this really. I don't have an anthropology background, but, but I guess, um, my interest is in at least trying to understand what long-term things can persist and uh, and and how humanity might thrive happily under a different uh, a different mode uh, going forward. So I, I part of the answer to your question that have I thought about you know how to get people back to the land um, you know. Part of the reason why I haven't is because I'm looking for longer term things that don't look very much like our current agriculture. And the other thing is by by permitting myself uh, as kind of a luxury to think really long term, I kind of, you know, think about, OK, we're at eight billion here. We need to be really small out here. And I just can put a giant question mark in the middle of how we get from one place to the other, mm -hmm. uh, partly because I don't think it will be designed. Um, I think it's just going to, you know, thing, things will happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I have fewer answers about the intermediate near term. Um, with that, so you're retired now, and I guess I don't know if you're still going to be hanging around campus very much or if you have plans to relocate. Are there, is, is there anything about sort of your personal geography uh, and choices you make about that? that are stemming from a lot of these thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I, I moved out of Southern California because that was not a place that I considered to be, you know, at all sustainable. Uh, almost no place in the U.S. would be. But I am in a more remote area in Washington State now that um, is more surrounded by nature and it's not as human dominated. And so I do get a lot more exposure to animals and um, and plants, and I I'm I feel like I'm able to integrate a little bit better into a um, a more natural environment. Again, it's it's sort of baby steps, and it's it's uh, it's not a, a full on abandonment of modernity, but it's it's a step in that direction. Before uh, we wrap up, um, are there any other Topics that that have been kind of in the front of your mind, or or questions that you would you you wish we had asked, or somebody would ask you that, that you want to talk about? Uh, no, I think we we definitely hit on a lot of um, things that have been on my mind, and I guess you know just maybe coming to the title of the 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 name of this um, podcast, Doomer Optimism. Uh, I did have an attraction to that name because I definitely see that that modernity is doomed to fail. It's just unsustainable. Things that are unsustainable fail mm -hmm. by definition. And so that's a reality. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not necessarily a, a position, a uh, belief as much as just that that's what happens to unsustainable things. The optimism part I'm attracted to in a way that I might not have been a few years ago. Mm. Uh, and, and the key, as I've said, for my optimism is, is breaking the conflation between modernity and humanity, that a failure of modernity is not a failure of humanity. And so that opens up an excitement uh, to think about what does it mean to be human in the context of the larger community of life. and what does that, what opportunities does that afford us to thinking about different ways of living? And, and so I think there's, there's reason to be optimistic about humanity. Um, no, not much reason to be optimistic about modernity. And so I think what I would recommend, what I recommend to people is to, you know, to the extent they can break the love affair with modernity it's not not helping anybody it's not helping individuals who who love it because it it's uh it's kind of a nasty partner and um so i think i think we can be doomerish on modernity and optimistic about humanity
Hmm. Nice. That's, that's really great. I wanted to make a quick plug and get you to briefly describe um, a, few, a few years back, you published kind of a textbook, I think, like sort of a college hmm. level textbook that outlines many, many different dimensions of the of the poly crisis. Yeah, it's um, never far away. Yeah. So that I, 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 I've, I've perused that. I think it's a it's an amazing resources. A lot of the stuff in there is going to be stuff that's familiar to Doomer Optimism audience and stuff. But it's a good kind of like, you know, you want to go back to like look up certain things or, you know, maybe for presenting to other people or something. Do you want to talk a bit about that, that textbook uh, project, what it what what it's about? And also, you know, if you have something going on right now or you want to plug something or you want people to follow you on your blog or or whatever sort of things you want to plug now. Yeah, so the, the textbook, it's available for free. It's PDF. Uh, it's open access. Just look for Energy Ambitions and Murphy and you'll almost certainly find it. Um, it's, it's a textbook I put out in 2021 that paralleled the course that I taught in at UC San Diego. I never really liked the textbooks available to me because they sort of didn't tell it like it is the way I, I see it. And they shied away from from some of the hard truths. And um, and I integrated more things about, you know, growth in general and how our society might react to all this. Um, but again, uh, it was 2021 and I've changed a lot since then. So when I look at the textbook now and I just taught from it last spring, my last uh, quarter teaching at UC San Diego, and I was pretty disappointed in it because it it asks the wrong questions, it thinks in the wrong mode. I hadn't really, I was still suffering this sort of anxiety over well, what what do we do now? This is a tough problem, and I don't see our way out of it. And since then, I've I've had in a sense more optimism because I have. Uh, realized that humanity is not modernity, and I've um, realized how important worldviews are. And there's some hints of it, and sort of the epilogue and a few of the appendices. I'm started starting to work my way toward thinking differently. Um, but yeah, the the blog, do the math. I've been keeping up a weekly um, output of of uh, essays that that visit some of these you know, larger concepts um, and and uh, philosophies in a sense. So that's something to keep up with. It's often republished on resilience.org, uh, these pieces. So you might see them there. Um, I turned off comments on do the math because it's just such a hassle to keep up with comments and, and manage, you know, responsible and uh, good behaviors. So, uh, but resilience does support comments so if you want to comment on my things that's where you would go to do it uh real quick um your blog do the math so you've talked about kind of where the math doesn't add up in a general sense of you know infinite growth on a finite planet uh, doesn't doesn't add up um is there anything i don't know any any uh specifics i, don't, I know it's probably the wrong time of the conversation to get into it but any other specifics where when you were looking into it some claim that the math just didn't add up, whether it's renewable energy or something. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely, I, I almost feel like calling the, the blog did the math because the, the math part is kind of done. And, you know, there's only so many ways you can calculate how much solar potential we have and whatever. Um, so, um, there are definitely a lot of claims out there that are, are dubious or, or miss the whole picture. Um, and and so, you know, the, I did write a, a recent one on fusion on the National Ignition Facility that was very quantitative and showed how, you know, completely ridiculous it was to imagine that mode as a, you know, realistic um, energy solution. So uh, occasionally I'll, I'll dip my toe back in into that. Um, lately, I guess a lot of my quantitative thought has been around ecological metrics and just how dire uh, those look. And and that's that's hard for me to get out of my brain at this point because it, it colors almost everything I see that those trends are so alarmingly bad. There's no way we could look at this and think that 
it can work. It's it's uh, so far from it. And then most of these things about you know renewable energy, for instance, don't even make contact with that reality. It's it's you know you're not saving the planet. You're saving modernity. You're saving. You're just putting a different engine in the machine that's wreaking havoc on our world. And I don't want that machine to have a different engine. I don't want that machine, you know. So uh, to me, so much of the focus now is is completely too too narrow and misguided and and misses the point entirely. Um, and it's almost painful to watch, but the early part of do the math was in that mode of completely focused on the um on the ins and outs of sort of on the energy front and resources front and that's you know certainly a part of the story but it's very incomplete all right um josh do you have any other comments or questions i this has been really good and i thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, I'll definitely keep following your blog. Is there any other way that you would recommend people to stay engaged just through resilience or through your blog? Or do you have any other big initiatives coming up that you want help with? Or, uh, Well, one thing I should mention I, I haven't is that I, I helped uh, co-found a group of academics called PLAN, the Planetary Limits Academic Network. So you know, if you're basically an academic, uh, if you're an active scholar and, you know, um, uh, feel out of place in your academic environment and that, you know, you're isolated and don't have colleagues to talk to, this is a place where you might find people who, and, and it's not a doomer club. Uh, I might be kind of almost, you know, at, at one end of the spectrum there, but it's it's a place where where people are very concerned about planetary limits and that you know, what we're doing isn't working and brainstorming about, uh, you know, ways to to deal with this. So that's that's one place that it is suitable for some people. Uh, I am thinking about other ways to reach out, animations, storytelling, um, but I haven't really produced anything there yet. But now that I'm retired, maybe that, that can happen. Sounds like you want to start a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's an idea. Uh, but there's never want to. By the way, yeah. if you ever want a guest host, if there's somebody you want to talk to, we we always love having various different hosts um, on the podcast. So I just wanted to extend that. If you're interested. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we're good. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I enjoyed this conversation, and I I, I want to now. I want to go check out your blog. I've heard about it, but I don't think I've actually gone to it. So I think I, I feel motivated to do that. Yeah, super. Um, and let's see, what's the, are we done recording or? Uh, well, we are right now. <laughs>